President Grimson and distinguished guests, uh, I'd like to begin first by, by thanking President Grimson and the organizers of this conference for inviting me. And it's an honor and privilege to have the opportunity to participate in this very important event. As has been alluded to in the introduction during the past 35 years, uh, I've had a lot of experience in, in dealing with renewable energy technologies on several fronts. First, as a young engineering scientist at the Los Alamos Laboratory in pursuit of hot, dry rock geothermal. Later, as was mentioned, as director of MIT's Energy Lab for 12 years, and now most recently as director of the Energy Institute at Cornell. All of these experiences have taught me much about the importance of having a diverse energy portfolio, one that also emphasizes uh, things that are sustainable and secure and affordable for our energy future. Today, I'd like to share some of those perspectives on how the U.S. might follow the path that Iceland has to utilize its diverse and abundant geothermal resources. To start out, I'd like to provide some motivation uh, behind why the United States has got to make this transformation and, and there should be a sense of urgency about it. We've heard words recently from the President uh, about our need to lead a transformation. Energy resources and the services they provide are critical to any nation's social, economic, and environmental well-being. We use energy to stay comfortable in our buildings, to move people and goods, perform industrial processes, and to support agricultural activities. During the 21st century, our needs for such services will grow substantially in certain regions of the world, but the methods with which we provide energy today and provide these services must change dramatically to meet the kind of environmental objectives and resource limitations that will undoubtedly exist over the next 100 years. The reasons behind this transformation are clear and have been repeated many times at this, at this conference and in other, other venues. Uh, despite the, the desirable energy storage characteristics of fossil fuels, high performance, convenience, today relatively low costs considering what they deliver for us and relatively abundant supplies, and most importantly, a highly de developed infrastructure to transport and distribute them. So as a result of this, the world and the United States is no exception, uh, depends on its primary energy from about 85% of that comes from fossil fuels and coal, oil, and natural gas. The combined growth of, of population and economic capacity in both developing and developed countries is causing continued a continued increase in energy demand and consumption, possibly doubling every, every decade or two. In addition, <clears throat> even with these improvements in energy efficiency in the U.S. and Europe, we are not keeping pace with the increased growth in demand. For over a century, key elements of America's strength have been in the diversity of our people, our products, our ideas, our rich natural resources, <clears throat> including our climate, and the abundance of low-cost fossil energy. Now, <clears throat> now is the time to add <clears throat> energy diversity to our national portfolio. I hope to show you this afternoon how geothermal can and should be a part of this strategy. These three attributes are, are clear in any kind of sustainable energy system. Economic well-being, the environment at all these scales from local to, re to global effects and national and international security. And from an engineering perspective, the accessibility, affordability, and performance of any energy system and how it interacts with the environment are really at the heart of the struggle. <clears throat> Cornell itself has reframed itself or redefined itself in terms of sustainability around what we refer to as the three E's of sustainability. First, energy, then economic development, and environment. And where a lot of the interesting work occurs today is at the intersections of these domains. Uh, there's a lot of connectivity that has to be established that hasn't been true in universities in the past, and Cornell sees this as, as a challenge to do this. Many other universities are following similar paths, but it will require change as well as uh, a new generation of students and faculty. Climate change is a major issue facing all of us. 
I shouldn't have to explain that to this audience. There are few who maybe not, do not necessarily uh, accept climate change the same way that most people do, that are basing it on scientific information, but there are many other indicators. We've heard a lot about indicators today in the sustainability space that suggest we need to transition from this age of hydrocarbons to a more sustainable destination. Here's just a few. Depletion of, of, uh, of non-renewable resources, de rising dependencies in certain regions on oil and gas, national security implications, the, the environmental impacts, particularly those associated with unconventional fossil fuels. In some of the talks this morning, I heard reference to the shale gas and shale oil revolution that's going on in the United States. We have to be careful uh, to do the kind of inventory analysis and the life cycle analysis that's required uh, to really assess the environmental impacts that may be produced from some of these. These include shale oil and gas, oil shales, tar sands, and heavy oils, which unless we get on this transition, we'll be <clears throat> dealing with them in the same way that we are, are now at high, high consumption. Many of you may have seen diagrams like this, but the reason I'm showing it today is not to to uh, get into the details of the number, but for two reasons. One, to show you again where the primary fuels are coming from that are used in the US in these three domains over here, natural gas, coal, and oil. And then this little small green bar that's labeled, excuse me, the purple bar that's labeled biomass and other, geothermal is buried in there somewhere, and a big portion of it is biomass right now in the US. And almost none of that <clears throat> is used at the level that it could be relative to the resources we have. So let's take a look at where the energy system and the country itself may go. We have 315 million people. This is more like an asymptotic type solution to what uh, the United States might evolve to over a long period of time. There's many demographers that think we could be at a half a billion people uh, before we really reach a, 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 an asymptote. The land use density, fairly easy to calculate, even if we include Alaska and other parts of the country which really aren't suitable for, for human habitation. The primary energy demand in this unit of quads, which is roughly the same as an exajoule, is fortunately leveling out a little bit, but there still are concerns for the long term. And if you compute this on a terawatt basis uh, as, a po as, as continuous energy consumption, we're at about three terawatts now, and we may get as high as something approaching five. Per capita consumption is still high. We have a lot of cars and trucks. That could grow as well as time marches on. And interestingly enough, and I'm going to make some comparisons in a moment or two between Iceland and the United States, we have a terawatt, one million megawatts of electric generating capacity right now in the U.S., primarily coming from three or four sources and not from renewables. Uh, with the exception of hydro, which has about 10% over all of this. And that could grow, and there's an increased uh, electrification going on in the country, so we see that happening. And in addition, over the past few years, although this is probably not a race that we want to win, uh, China now is in the leadership position as the top energy consumer as a country in the world and the top emitter of CO2. A few years ago, we decided to re-examine the way in which we're using energy in the United States by creating a thermal spectrum, if you will, of lower temperatures, and this is starting at, uh, oh, about uh, 280 degrees Celsius here, down to ambient type temperatures. And in each one of those bars, we've uh, taken an average uh, of what the total consumption per year is of primary energy that's used to provide uh, heat, in, in this case, at low temperatures. You can see from the, the red and yellow and blue bars, they're all in the low temperature domain, almost ideally matched, by the way, to geothermal. And you ask the question, well, why haven't we been doing more of this? Well, part of the reason is that we've been using low cost and affordable gas and oil for a long period of time to essentially contribute to that domain and provide about 25% of our energy use comes from using these fuels, a lot of it in buildings, of course, but at temperatures less than 120 degrees C. We would like to think that uh, there might be a solution to this, and the usual approach you see is that there'll be some collage of renewables, and they all look good from 
a sustainability vantage point. They get very high sustainability metrics for the most part. The resources, regardless of, of where we happen to be uh, in the United States, vary widely in quality and availability. And for the most part, <clears throat> in terms of being competitive with some of the choices we have now, particularly low-cost gas, natural gas, the costs remain relatively high. And in the United States, the emphasis, from my perspective, has been on wind, solar PV, and biofuels, with geothermal very undervalued and often ignored completely uh, in, in various discussions and, and the way in which the, the programs are supported uh, in federal and state governments. Not all the incentives are put in place all the time for, for geothermal where they might be for other, other renewables. We all know that uh, the beauty of this resource is it has great diversity in how it can be used. It can be used for electricity, for heating, and for in the use of heat pumps, which are actually being deployed at a pretty high rate in the U.S., uh, it becomes a, a, a very accessible uh, act, activity for many, many homeowners. So let's, let's trace the history for a moment. <clears throat> Base load dispatchable power and heat for both developed and developing countries. Most of the other renewables, certainly wind and solar, are not able to deliver that without some backup system or storage system. So in some ways, geothermal is very complementary uh, to, uh, to these other resources that get an awful lot of attention these days. This is not a new field. Uh, in Lardarello, in, in Italy, in the early parts of the last century, uh, they started generating electricity. Today, we have 11,000 megawatts, keep that number in mind, online worldwide, that's capacity worldwide, and a significant amount of direct use in countries like Iceland and others. Uh, we have about 60,000 megawatts of thermal per annum, and if you count all the heat pumps that are in place, the geothermal heat pumps, that number is in excess of 3 million. And interestingly enough, uh, because geothermal has this old legacy like hydropower, uh, some fairly competitive costs, particularly in the range of direct heat supply and in, in electricity. So you might ask the question, well, we're in great shape. Unfortunately, uh, we have to depend on the existence of these very high-grade, high-gradient, uh, existing hydrothermal reservoirs where nature's put all of the, uh, the ingredients in place, as it has in Iceland and in parts of the U.S. and many other countries that are utilizing geothermal today. What we really need to think about, of course, is what would enable a real transformation? And we have one of the best examples in the world right here. Uh, in roughly 50 years, I apologize if some of these numbers aren't exactly right, but uh, they're what I'm basing the, this uh, point on. Uh, trans <clears throat> the country, Iceland, transformed itself from a country that was 100% dependent on imported oil and, and coal uh, to a renewable energy supply based primarily on geothermal and hydro. Today, it provides all, uh, virtually all of its heat in a, an incredibly uh, complex and elaborate district heating system. 20% of the electricity comes from geothermal and the remainder from hydro. They have world-scale aluminum plants that are being operated on greener energy. And a plan in place to try to evolve the transport system using high-grade renewable fuels, if you will, uh, that might be produced by very hot resources at high efficiency. Uh, so that is what I'd call a real transformation. And <clears throat> unfortunately, as we know, not every country has the resources of Iceland. So you immediately begin to think, well, let's make some comparisons here. And what I've done is, uh, and please excuse me for uh, taking some liberties here. Here's the population. So Iceland, in a sense, is 1,000 times smaller than the United States in terms of people. Uh, we consume 100 exajoules, 100 quads. You consume 0.23 exajoules, if the numbers are right that I've seen. We have a terawatt, a million megawatts of generating capacity. You have about 4,300. We have 3,400 megawatts right now of generating capacity from geothermal, 0.34%, if you will. And Iceland has 570 already at 13%. Interestingly enough, uh, you might, there are obviously fewer cars in Iceland th than there are in the US. But if you take the per capita ratio, uh, we're actually very close. And there are dozens of large cities, 
from, from New York City to Helena, Montana, and Iceland has one large city. So you say to yourself, this looks very easy to do. So we only have a challenge that's about 175 times greater. If we wanted to bring the geothermal to 100,000 megawatts of electric power to start with, which would put us roughly in the domain of where Iceland is here at 13% <coughs> in terms of capacity. Many of you are familiar with this report that I was privileged to work on several years ago while I was at MIT. And uh, the, the goal of this <coughs> initially was to provide an independent and comprehensive evaluation of EGS as a major primary energy supplier for the, for the United States over a long time period, over a 50 year period or so. The second goal was to look at the framework possibly for informing policymakers as to what support would be needed. At the time we did this report, we were restricted to looking at only electrical generation. We were not necessarily uh, looking at some of the carbon offsets that would occur from, uh, from using geothermal at the kind of scale that we're talking about, as you'll see soon. And <clears throat> we ended up with uh, perhaps a a, a slightly constrained view here as to what you possibly could do with geothermal. This was done several years ago and it's maybe time to take a second look. So the question that was raised, is there a feasible path from today's systems that we have in the US at 3,400 megawatts electric capacity to tomorrow's EGS with 100,000 megawatts or more capacity in this period of say to 2050? Ten years have passed, or not quite ten years, seven, seven or eight years, I guess, since we first published this report. <clears throat> but not a lot has happened in terms of growing that capacity. Uh, and there are many, many reasons why that's the case, but we can get into that later. It's perhaps more interesting to share what we're after here. If we look at the common characteristics or limitations of any geothermal system, we need accessibility. So we need high gradients. We have to be able to reach high temperature rock in a relatively cost-effective manner. Ultimately, we need a well-connected system, a, a system of wells, injection and production wells, and the ability to circulate water efficiently and effectively through that rock mass to literally extract or mine the heat. The second is that the water has to be produced at a rate which is sufficient to justify the kind of capital investment that's made in these systems, and it has to last long enough. So there's a sustainability question, and there's also an instant economic question of being able to recover some of those embedded costs in producing the system. And ultimately, we need a means of utilizing that. We certainly have plenty of those uh, with respect to the <coughs> kind of systems we have here in Iceland as well as around the world, ranging from direct steam flashing to organic ranking cycles, as well as even opportunities for doing things in a cogeneration and direct use space. So the idea behind EGS, and I like the word engineered rather than enhanced, because I think it more reflects what we actually have to do when nature doesn't provide all of the ingredients we need in, in its, these so-called high-grade hydrothermal systems. So we have chose to define this more broadly as engineered reservoirs, EGS as engineered reservoirs, that, <clears throat> have, that have been stimulated in a manner to emulate the production properties of high-grade commercial hydrothermal resources. And if you take such a definition, <clears throat> you essentially create a continuum, as I'll show you in a moment. But before I get there, I want to share with you at least some of the questions I think that underlie whether or not this could become a key supplier of primary energy in the US. The first is environmental stewardship. So what are the real environmental impacts, the benefits, and the trade-offs that result if we do a large-scale deployment in geothermal? Same questions would have to be asked for wind or solar or biomass for sure, one of the ones that has some of the biggest concerns if we, if we go very large scale with that. Thermodynamics, uh, the question of how we actually utilize geothermal energy and to address its thermodynamic potential. And the resource assessment area, we have a lot of information about the resource in the US, but what is the quality distribution and accessibility of this as we look across the country? And then finally, <clears throat> sustainability in terms of the production sustainability of the reservoirs, its renewability or recovery. There was an interesting talk given by Mr. Axelson this afternoon about the sustainability of geothermal as a resource. And many of the questions he's raised need to be looked at in, in this context as well. And then finally, the economics 
And this is economics in a competitive world where we have low-cost natural gas and we'll probably have it for a while uh, in the U.S. The stewardship area, uh, there's at least two concerns that uh, are out there <clears throat> with respect to the U.S. One is induced seismicity, uh, surely has to be managed and monitored. Water use in certain parts of the country uh, is a big, big issue. And we might have to go to totally dry cooling systems, as we've done in arid regions, but full reinjection and effective control and management of water as a resource. But there are some other benefits, big benefits, when we make comparisons. The land use, the footprint of geothermal, the essentially emissions-free character, the carbon-free, with, with total reinjection, virtually carbon-free, base load as opposed to interruptible uh, as a renewable, and storage or backup generation is not needed and adaptable <clears throat> for these diverse end uses, which is also not the case uh, for some of our other uh, renewable options. So first, a little lesson from thermodynamics. This is a, a diagram that plots uh, a quantity called exergy or availability as a function of temperature and pressure. And what we're looking at here is pure water. Many of you may be familiar with this if you're, if you're engineers, but it's this vertical scale over here that determines the maximum amount of, of power or useful work that we could get out of a heat resource, in this case from water, as a function of temperature and pressure. This is the, the so-called supercritical region where the Icelandic Deep Drilling Project is sort of aiming its, its uh, final end state. And unfortunately, uh, and this is really a consequence of how we actually use geothermal today, most of the hydrothermal resources in the world are down on this lower curve near the saturated liquid line. So those numbers that you read off the vertical y-axis tell us the best we can do if we make power out of the system as a function of temperature. If we have dry steam systems available, we'd be up here. And if we could go to supercritical, that is an enormous gain, as many of you know. Now imagine this for a moment. I'm going to give you 100 units of primary thermal energy but from any source. And then I'm going to tell you I'm going to take away 90 units of that and throw it into waste heat and not use it anymore and give you 10 units of useful work out of it. That's what happens today in most of the geothermal conversion that's done, with the exception of what happens in, in Iceland and other places where they have a cascaded system with combined heat and power. In the United States, almost all of our geothermal exclusively is is used for generating electricity with this enormous thermodynamic loss that we can't avoid. So it makes sense, perhaps we ought to look back at this thermal spectrum and re-examine, uh, and this is where I think we match the Icelandic example very well, can we do something about this 25%, which is primarily distributed to individual buildings in the form of natural gas and oil, and geothermal energy, if you were to match the resources that we have in the U.S. in terms of their temperature spectrum themselves, they match up almost identically with where our demand uh, structure is for thermal energy. So another way to look at this is uh, through this sort of continuum approach or diagram. And I've taken some liberties here because this is a two-dimensional uh, diagram and it's a multi-dimensional problem for sure. But if we plot, for example, a metric that scales with the grade of a resource here. So low gradients, high gradients. And if we also look at fluid content, a good hydrothermal system is going to have a lot of natural fluid in place, steam or hot water, and it will also have connectivity, high permeability between the injection and production zones so that we can continue to produce it for long periods of time at high rates. So you'd say, well, this looks great. Where do, where do all the resources go? Well, down in this region here, we have hydrothermal and we have lower lower grade and more challenging from an EGS point of view, uh, EGS. So you need these three critical ingredients, temperature, sufficient temperature depth, sufficient permeability, sufficient hot water or steam. And <clears throat> when we start to look at the United States, these are more recent maps that we've generated using some of the new geothermal uh, data that's come out of uh, the group at SMU working uh, for, with the DOE and others around the country to use the resource information we have. So we're now taking a slice at three and a half kilometers. Imagine what the temperatures is. The temperature scales over on the right. And we're just going to go deeper. This is at five and a half kilometers. For those of you that know American geography, this is Yellowstone here, Imperial Valley in California here. What you probably didn't realize is that there are actually some fairly high grade areas in terms of, of EGS 
uh, in the eastern part of the country, and that's where a lot of people live. And if we go to seven and a half kilometers, not really uh, reachable right now in terms of the economics, but certainly reachable in terms of the technology that we have for drilling, uh, the resource becomes much different and a much different view than just concentrating on a few western states. So to sum this up again, here's Iceland here in the lower right-hand corner, and here's New York up here. So if you're the governor of New York, or if you're inter I'm living in New York now, you have to think a little bit differently about how you would use geothermal. It's not going to be competitive necessarily with uh, just electricity, but we have a lot of demand for heat. As I was flying into Reykjavik yesterday and driving back from the airport, I couldn't help but think this reminds me of what half of the country is in the northern latitudes of America. We have snow, we have real winter, and we have a high heating demand, and we're not really utilizing uh, those low-grade resources in that manner. So there is an opportunity, and I think a big opportunity for us to, to sort of access that part of the spectrum. In the future of geothermal report, <clears throat> we had a graph like this that talked about both high-grade hydrothermal, geopressured. This is a logarithmic scale on the, on the y-axis and exajoules. Keep in mind that the, the 100 here, which is 100 exajoules, or 10 to the 18th joules, is our annual consumption. And that appears on this diagram right there. So these are orders of magnitude larger in terms of the stored energy. And most, most people who work on geothermal know this. The big trick is, how do we get access to that and utilize it in, in a manner which would be acceptable <clears throat> from an economic point of view as well as from, a, from an environmental point of view? But there's plenty of it, particularly if we go into these lower grade uh, and mid-grade EGS systems. We took a, a, a first stab at this. This is obviously very speculative as to what we might be able to recover. So here we have 100, 100 exajoules of demand per year and 14 million exajoules of stored energy that's down to 10 kilometers, all of which we could access with today's drilling technology. So it's not a question of getting there, nor is it a question of how much. It's much more a question of how much can we extract and how much can we do that in a sustainable economic manner. So we, if you, even if you just take a fraction of a percent, as many of you know, you get numbers which are far in excess of our annual energy use. So this looks good from that point of view. There is a lot of history that goes along with, with EGS, hot dry rock as it started out, uh, major programs that are in deeper blue here, going on in Australia, going on in Europe, formerly at the Fenton Hill site that Los Alamos operated, in, in Japan and at Rosmanaus in the Cornish Granites, as well as other smaller projects that have the potential to grow. We heard about some of them today uh, in the U.S., at, at, in Newberry, in Oregon, in Coso, Desert Peak, as well as in the geysers field, where you could use some of these engineering principles to greatly enhance the recovery. There's a lot of interesting and important activity going on now in Europe. Uh, some of it carries with it some concerns, like the Basel experience with seismic, but also at Landau and other places where we're seeing it being utilized in a much more effective manner. But the critical challenge when all is said and done and you read our long report or you, you look at this carefully is creating this connectivity, trying to emulate the productivity of a good hydrothermal system. So that connectivity issue uh, is what engineering this reservoir is really all about. It's not being provided by high permeability highly fractured rock that's full of, full of water and steam. So you have to come up with ways to do this. And those major field tests, as well as the smaller ones, have been focused on that. And one might argue that it had a lot of time, almost 35 years or so, of, of fairly intensive testing on and off. We've done a lot of things, and I think we fail to recognize that some of this is important, uh, particularly the ability to directionally drill, to five plus kilometers of temperatures in excess of 300. The Icelanders are even further along in that, not necessarily in depth, but certainly in temperature. Uh, the diagnostics and models uh, that are used to characterize size and, and the thermal hydraulic behavior of EGS reservoirs, many of those have been in place for a while. They need to be tested and validated more with real data. We can certainly make large regions of stimulated rock. This is a picture on the left of, of the Salts Reservoir. I could take similar uh, similar types of micro seismic event maps uh, taken from uh, Cooper Basin or from Fenton Hill or Rosmanaus for that matter, uh, and they look very similar in terms of the size of that stimulated region. This is cubic kilometers 
of rock that has been stimulated. How effective that is and how we can produce it for long periods of time is, it remains to be seen, but certainly connectivity has been established and we're roughly off by a factor of, of two to three in terms of the commercial levels that exist now in hydrothermal systems. Manageable and controllable water losses and manageable seismic and subsidence effects and net heat generation. So this brings you to the kind of last area, <clears throat> which is the economics. And uh, many, many models have existed for a number of years, certainly 30 years or more, and they all tend to focus on different major attributes of, of a geothermal system. First, resource quality and accessibility, productivity and lifetime, how it's actually used, whether it's electricity, direct use, direct heat or cogen, and a bunch of economic factors that relate to important variables, such as the cost of drilling a well the surface plant cost, the cost of infrastructure uh, for uh, energy transmission and distribution, and a range of finan financial parameters, too, that I think when we're talking about electricity and supplying it to the grid uh, has a very different uh, kind of financing model than it would if we were talking about doing district heat in terms of municipal delivery of heat. The policies and incentives from renewable energy credits to tariffs to feed-in taxes, feed-in tariffs, et cetera, are all there. When we start to look at the resources and just plot a fraction <coughs> of the total cost between the surface and subsurface parts, we see a dramatic shift to the subsurface when we get into low-grade EGS systems. Consequently, one of the big reasons why we're concerned with the stimulation aspect of this flow control, uh, getting large areas and volumes. So you can't avoid this. Uh, it's just that the drilling costs go up. Uh, more or less at a high order with respect to depth. And here's a, a plot of this. We've recently updated uh, the cost data that we've had in our uh, earlier report <clears throat> using uh, available geothermal data from the United States as well as from other places and comparing it with the massive uh, oil and gas database that we have from the Joint Association Survey. And what we're looking at here is cost in millions of dollars. This, again, is a, a logarithmic scale, so be careful when you read it. This is $1 million, $10 million, $100 million. And these are depths here in either feet or, or meters, whatever you like. And uh, you can see a couple of things from this diagram. The red line is what we're using right now in some of the modeling I'm going to show you. The open squares represent individual ultra-deep oil and gas wells. We have drilled some wells out here uh, to, to this deeper horizon, <clears throat> the, uh, some of the deep wells in, in geothermal. But we have never gone beyond this range. And so these squares, these triangles here, are produced by a model called, called Well Cost Light, which uh, has been uh, adapted in, in a very uh, complete model. And as long as the costs going into it are correct, it gives you a complete picture of, of the total drilling enterprise from when you skid the rig up to the site and, and take care of the early drilling as well as the deeper directional drilling. We hope that this will answer some questions for us, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on all the details of the economics, but I want to share with you uh, some of the, the challenges. So <clears throat> if we look at just levelized electricity cost right now and compare it for different types of resources. So this is in the range of what we have in the eastern part of the United States, and this looks more like the western part and Iceland would be far further over to the right in terms of its, uh, its resource, shallower resources, very high grade. The blue bars represent sort of today's drilling technologies and costs and low, lower flow rates. These are lower production rates that have been actually achieved in practice in EGS systems. And if we change that and improve the drilling technology, I, excuse me, in the yellow bars, use today's drilling technology, the costs I showed you, go to higher flow rates, obviously we have to drill fewer wells, so that drops the drilling component in terms of number of wells, we get a much better picture, but still certainly not competitive in this region with electricity, and, but now becoming more and more competitive. And if we went to advanced drilling and we're somehow able to achieve a fairly rapid, some people think miracle, to, to really fundamentally change drilling costs as a function of depth, perhaps we could do this universally from low to high grade. So again, just recall this early picture. This is the five and a half kilometer depth picture of the continental U.S. Where we are producing geothermal today in the United States is in these western states that have high grade, high gradient, 
existing hydrothermal reservoirs. Where we would like to produce them, obviously, are in systems where we have to stimulate by EGS in high-grade areas. They would be the early targets, if you will, but eventually moving to the eastern uh, United States. So there's no question that projected costs for EGS look promising in the western U.S. Where, <clears throat> but what about geothermal opportunities in these lower-grade regions in the east? That's what, where we've changed things, uh, I think, from what we did initially. So we're starting to take a much more careful look at direct use and district heating. Where better to come to talk about that but to Iceland? This is a new model that we presented just a few weeks ago at the geothermal, Stanford Geothermal Workshop. Uh, we've kind of labeled it geofires. There are other models that are out there. Getem is one of the famous ones that the U.S. uses to kind of do projections of what costs might involve. But what's different about this is not only can we get the levelized cost of electricity, we can also get the levelized cost of heat, introduce multiple end-use option choices for including cogen as well as electricity of heat, and in a simple format that can be used uh, quite quickly. We hope that this is in a sort of beta test form now, so I'm going to show you some of the early results. Uh, this gives you an example of the sort of imposed thermal drawdown that we put in a system to look at the effect of that on an economics and a whole set of variables that have to be specified. So what I'm going to show you are a series of three graphs that represent <clears throat> the levelized uh, cost of energy, both electricity and heat for different reservoir qualities, if you will, or different resource qualities, 80 here, high, 60, 40, 25. So more looking like the east over on this side of the diagram, the American West here, and in the far left are the current average U.S. prices we have for electricity and heat. Now, we've got to be careful. We have a unit shift here. The blue bars are in, uh, in cents per kilowatt hours, so that's 10.8 what that goes to over on the left-hand side, and the pink bars, or red bars here, are actually in dollars per million BTUs. I'll have to apologize for that unit, but that's what we use right now uh, for comparing it with gas. This is the delivered price to a, to a commercial venture or to a private, private customer, averaged over the whole country. And it's used with current technology. So when we look at the four cases that we've examined, what we're comparing now is what I showed you in the earlier graph. But instead of just focused on electricity, we're now focused on heat and electricity. And you can see a very interesting picture. In these high-grade areas, we have something that looks already uh, competitive. This is at low flow, a third or a fourth of what we really need for a commercial hydrothermal system. And in the lower grade <coughs> regions, uh, it's not quite competitive yet, but that would change rapidly. But certainly, we're not going to make electricity in there for some time. If we go to a mature sort of projection, what we might have in 50 years, and compare that with what, is, what the projections are for escalated uh, let's say, f fossil fuel and natural gas, which I think are only just guesses at this point. Who knows what the cost of gas will be 10 years from now, not to mention 10 months from now. But uh, certainly these are, these are what are out there if we look at EIA projections in the U.S., both for gas and, and electricity. So they're showing going from 10.2 or 10.8 cents as an average price to only 11 cents in the next 50 years. And gas only essentially doubling or so in price from where, where it is now as a delivered cost. If we increase the productivity of these reservoirs, use current day uh, drilling costs and escalate those to the, this time period or current drilling technology, we can be pretty competitive, both with respect to uh, electricity in high grade areas and heat in low grade areas. This combines them all into one, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on that. It's a pretty busy graph. But I think if you, uh, if you look at this, you get, you get the picture immediately that going to direct use makes sense in these low-grade areas. So we did a little bit of this at sort of a more higher resolution. Uh, we looked at New York and Pennsylvania in particular, uh, partly because we had a lot more data. The original map of the United States that David Blackwell put together to show heat flow and temperature gradients that was in the future of geothermal report had about 30 data points for New York State. Because of the gas drilling that's gone on and the accessibility with this new database to much larger sets of data, we've taken that, combined for New York and Pennsylvania, and expanded the number of data points, if you will, to 8,000. 
And they're actually shown here in black on this diagram. So we're now basing the, the, re the resource assessment on, on much firmer ground. So I think we can say with confidence, although it's not looking like it's going to change the final answer much, it certainly tells us where the higher grade regions are. And what we've done recently in a study is also examine where heat is used in the states. And in, in a sense, this scales directly with population and the size of communities. Those of you that need some orientation, this is New York City down here. Shouldn't be any surprise that we have enormous heat demand. So this, the capacity, if you will, of the, uh, of the thermal demand is, is quite significant. And also we have a significant opportunity even if you imagine now coming to these states. These are, these are in regions of price now where we start to look at <clears throat> areas here where you might immediately think about putting in direct use uh, and rebuilding the infrastructure in these communities. New York has a lot of very old and tired cities that could use uh, some revitalization. Along the New York State Thruway, which runs from Albany all the way to Buffalo, if you go down and look at Binghamton, which is in this location, we have a, a group of communities we refer to as the Rust Belt Seven. Uh, these are communities which were thriving in the 1950s and 60s and have gone, undergone some departure from that. They need all of their infrastructure eventually replaced, and it would be a great opportunity to think about doing this for, for, uh, for, for New York. These examples can be followed in other places. We've taken supply curves uh, as, a, as an approach to this. So this is the total heating capacity now of Pennsylvania and uh, New York combined, 60 gigawatts of thermal per annum, and how we could provide that <clears throat> using either current technology uh, as well as evolving technology. And, and I think as you can see that uh, there's an awful lot of flatness to this supply curve here, which would be very attractive. The dotted line there is the current cost of heating uh, in commercial and, and building establishments. Another part of this has to do with where existing infrastructure is in place already. Uh, Cornell has, has taken on a, a, a program as part of its sustainability objectives to go to a zero carbon footprint. And to do this, they're obviously going to have to use renewable resources. And two of the ones that look like they might have a way to work together in a synergistic fashion are biomass. We have a lot of acreage. This is in a fairly rural part of New York State. And we're sitting on top of one of those anomalies, if you will, those eastern anomalies uh, in, in, in New York itself. So the possibility of doing this and replacing the very efficient gas-fired system we have now that does cogen with a geothermal and biomass system looks very attractive. So let me sum up. A lot has been accomplished in, in EGS, but I would be uh, not telling the total true story if I didn't say there's a lot more left to do, particularly these, in these three important areas. We have got to be able to demonstrate, not in models, but out in the field, how fluid production with acceptable flow impedance uh, could be done at a commercial level, at the 60 to 80, 75, even maybe higher uh, kilograms per second. We need to demonstrate sustainable heat extraction lifetimes. We can't see rapid drawdown as just an excuse uh, for proving that we can make this work for a commercial level if it's not going to last sufficiently long to justify that kind of investment. And we've got to do this in more than one place. I think it has to be at more than one site. These three areas were exactly the same things we emphasized in the 2006 report. So we're coming back to it, but now we're trying to give it a little bit different uh, perspective in that we might be able to, to even diversify the way in which we use geothermal beyond just electricity. So several large-scale field demonstrations are still needed. Uh, this is a, a, an update from that earlier report. Things have changed. Drilling costs have doubled. A lot of the infrastructure costs more now and uh, some of the other uh, attributes that go along with geothermal. But supporting resource assessment, that's started. We'd like to see that continue. Support four to five demonstrations across the country that would be staged over time that look initially, let's say, at high grade. So to really get aggressive about what we're doing in places like Newberry and other, other locations in the west to begin with and then move quickly towards the east and maintain, uh, obviously, a vigorous supporting research. I think there's a lot to be done here in the way of collaborative uh, work back and forth between countries like Iceland, others in Europe, our friends in Australia and other places that are active in this area. So how much is this going to cost? 
Back in, in our early report, we came up with a figure of about 800 million, not per year, important to remember that, but distributed over a period of time. So this is $160 million a program per, per year nominally for EGS. We have a, a total geothermal program in the country right now that's nominally about $40 million a year. So it's not big enough to, to get us there. How, however, when we look at perspective here, this entire cost is less than the price of one clean coal plant. And if we get on the path of doing clean coal, We've uh, already made a major commitment to burning coal for a long, long period of time. So I think looking at that option is important. So I'd like to thank you and thank Iceland for leading the way to help us transition to a sustainable, low-carbon future with geothermal.